Welcome to Up With The Son, a program dedicated to the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Up With The Sun is produced by Community Educational Television, San Antonio Community Educational TV, and Jacksonville Educators Broadcasting. Now we present Up With The Sun. Well, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Andy Woods, and I'm a professor of Bible and theology at the College of Biblical Studies in Houston. And uh, it's, been, it's going to be my privilege to lead you over the next few mornings, uh, a 10-part series covering the book of Revelation. I don't think there's a more exciting book to uh, discover or to read than the book of Revelation. And uh, typically what we do when we begin to work our way through a book is we try to uh, take a look at some background issues in the book. And uh, this morning and perhaps uh, tomorrow morning as well, I'm going to be leading you through a few background issues in the book. And after we finish working our way through some background issues, then in subsequent sessions we'll start taking a look at the biblical text itself. But uh, what is the book of Revelation about? Let's look at a few background issues if we could. And uh, as we advance the slides, uh, the first thing we typically look at <clears throat> when we take a look at the background of a book is its title. And you'll notice there in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. So you'll notice right there out of the gate that the book of Revelation gives us a title. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now you'll notice here that it is not the revelation of John. Sometimes study Bibles incorrectly label this the revelation of John. It's not the revelation of John, it's the revelation of Jesus. And something else that's very helpful to understand is that the title Revelation, it's the Greek noun apocalypsis, which means unveiling. The title of the book is, it's a singular noun. Apocalypsis is a singular noun. And so we don't refer to this as the book of Revelations, as many people do. I've even heard preachers refer to it as the book of Revelations, plural, but it is not the book of Revelations, plural. It is the book of Revelation singular, and it was narrated, as I'll show you in just a minute, ultimately from God the Father to John on the island of Patmos in one basic sitting. So there aren't multiple revelations here. This all came to John uh, one particular afternoon there on the island of Patmos. So we call it the revelation of Jesus Christ, not John's revelation, and it's a singular noun. And the book is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about the Antichrist or the coming one world uh, commercial system or things like that. But it's all about Jesus. And it's about the unveiling of Christ's final phase of redemption. Because you see, Jesus Christ has already entered into human history to pay a sin debt <coughs> for the sins of the world. And he's coming back to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And so that final phase of the return of Jesus Christ, the final phase of his plan is highlighted in this book. And as we advance the slides, another issue we like to look at is the authorship. In other words, we ask ourselves, who wrote uh, this particular book? And you'll notice right there in Revelation chapter uh, 1 and verse 1, you'll see the name John right at the end of the uh, verse. And so uh, consequently, this is what we would call the, uh, a book that in essence was written uh, by John. Ultimately, it comes from Christ, but it was uh, given to John for the purpose of recording. So John would be the human author of this book. And as you see from the slide there, I had it up just a minute ago, but John's name is mentioned about five times in this book. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, verse 4, verse 9, and then a couple of times at the end of the book, chapter 21, verse 2, chapter 22, verse 8. So this would be John, one of the Lord's disciples. And 
You remember that Jesus and John had a very special relationship during Christ's earthly ministry. And now uh, this uh, vision at the end of uh, John's earthly life is given to John by Jesus Christ in the form of a vision. So John is the author. John, you'll recall, wrote five <laughs> New Testament books. He wrote the Gospel of John, the, uh, the little epistles of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And now this is the fifth book that he contributed to our biblical canon called the Book of Revelation. And as we advance the slide, uh, another issue we like to take a look at is the place of writing. Uh, where was this particular book written from? And if you take a look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, you'll see that John was on an island called Patmos. Uh, where is Patmos? It's a little tiny island <clears throat> off the coast of Asia Minor. Uh, it's in the Aegean Sea. It's about 60 miles or so southwest of Ephesus. It's a little island that ab abounded in volcanic rock. And it is the place where an emperor, a Roman emperor named Domitian, exiled people. Uh, everything we know about the reign of Domitian indicates that he, to troublemakers, oftentimes did not cut off their heads the way Nero did. But he would, instead of what, doing what Nero did, he would take troublemakers and he would banish them. And John was one of those troublemakers. And so he got, towards the end of his life and ministry and career, exiled on this little tiny island uh, off the coast of Asia Minor there in the Aegean Sea. Now, what got John into trouble? Well, we don't know exactly. I have a suspicion it had to do with the fact that he kept preaching about a kingdom that was to come. You know, our Lord, when he taught us to pray, he said, thy kingdom come. And as I'll show you in just a minute, the book of Revelation is, is essentially an answer to that prayer. It's the coming of the kingdom to the earth. But John kept speaking of this coming kingdom, and that was a threat to the Romans because the Romans said, well, we're, we're the kingdom. What do you mean a coming kingdom? And so if you spoke too, too aggressively about a coming kingdom, it got you into trouble with Domitian. And so John was such a man, and there he was exiled uh, off the coast of Asia Minor. And it, in fact, was the divine blueprint of uh, God for John to be uh, exiled on this island because it's here that John would receive a great vision that we call the book of Revelation. The audience in the book, if you take a look at chapter 1 and verse 11, the audience in the book is the seven churches of Asia Minor. Uh, chapter 1, verse 11 says, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And it mentions them, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You see, because John, towards the end of his life, was the last living apostle, and he was the bishop over these seven churches in uh, Asia Minor. And so it would be fitting for Jesus to communicate to those seven churches through John. John was well respected as their bishop. Many of the folks in those churches knew John personally. And John is simply communicating to them from an island. He's going to receive a vision and somehow that vision is going to be sent to these various churches. Now, that helps us interpret the book because the audience is a Christian audience that is being communicated to here in this book. Uh, for example, if you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, uh, it says this, I, John, your brother. So you see how John connects his own spiritual status with that of his audience. And so very clearly, uh, you're dealing here with a believing Christian audience there in Asia Minor in these various churches. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting is John keeps referring to them as overcomers. In fact, the title overcomer is used about seven times or so in Revelation 2 and 3. And remember, John wrote five books. He also wrote the epistle of 1 John. And in 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, you'll see very clearly that an overcomer is someone who has been born of the Spirit of God. 
So if we interpret overcomer the way John defines it for us over in 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, we see very clearly that we're dealing with a Christian audience. There's other hints as well. For example, over in Revelation 3 and verse 19, to the church at Laodicea, it says, Those, Jesus is speaking, whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So you might recall the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, where whom the Lord loves, the Lord disciplines. Whom whom belongs, the person that belongs to the Lord is the one that is disciplined by the Lord. You know, I typically don't go next door and discipline my neighbor's kids. Not that I haven't been tempted to from time to time. But you discipline your own children. You don't discipline someone else's child because your own child belongs to you. And so Christ is willing to impose discipline on these churches because we're dealing with a believing audience. So the audience would be a Christian audience. And uh, advancing the slides just a little bit here, we come to another major issue that we like to look at, and that's the date. Uh, We typically ask the question, when was this particular book written? And the answer would be about A.D. 95. And we know that from the statement on the screen by a guy named Irenaeus. Let me read this statement to you. Irenaeus writes, But if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly at the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse. Now notice what he says, for it, now it there modifies apocalypse, for it was, writ, it was seen not long ago, but almost in our own time at the end of the reign of Domitian. Now you'll notice that it modifies apocalypse and it tells us very clearly that the apocalypse or it was written towards the end of the reign of Domitian. Domitian left the throne about A.D. 96, and so most people from the statement we just read would date this book about A.D. 95, just before Domitian left the throne. And um, who was this guy Irenaeus? Why is he so important? Well, Irenaeus is a church father who wrote very early on in church history. He's one generation removed from John. So John the apostle who knew Christ, John discipled a guy named Polycarp. Uh, Polycarp in turn um, discipled a man named Irenaeus. So Irenaeus is kind of like, uh, you know, that commercial when so-and-so talks, people listen. Uh, Sometimes you you hear commercials that way. And so when Irenaeus talks, we should listen because he was one generation removed from John. And so Irenaeus in the statement we saw just a little earlier is very clear that the book of Revelation was written at the end of the reign of Domitian. In fact, nobody ever thought the book was written during the reign of Nero. I'll describe that in just a minute, that view. But nobody thought that until the 5th century A.D. And so the earliest testimony we have indicates that this book was written during the reign of Domitian. Now, there are those today who try to date the book of Revelation in the 60s, not the 90s, not the date I just gave you, but the 60s. And many people who advocate that view are trying to communicate a doctrine called preterism. Preterism is the view that the book of Revelation already happened. Uh, There are actually theologians and writers out there that are trying to argue that the book of Revelation already happened. They'll try to argue that chapters 4 through 22 of the book was already fulfilled primarily. Some would say some was fulfilled. Others would say all of it was fulfilled. In the events of A.D. 70 when Titus of Rome uh, invaded the nation of Israel in A.D. 70. So they are called preterists. Preterist means past or bygone. Uh, in Latin. And so they're trying to argue the book of Revelation already happened. They're saying, don't look for a future Antichrist. Uh, Nero, for example, was the Antichrist and these sorts of things. And there's a big problem with their view. How can the book of Revelation be a prophecy about A.D. 70 if it was written 25 years after A.D. 70? And so they ignore what Irenaeus said and they try to instead date the book in the reign of uh, Nero about A.D. 65. But you see, that view is very difficult to maintain. 
as we advance the slides just for a minute, let me show you why. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 6, it mentions uh, an individual there, or a church there rather, named Ephesus. And it says of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, you have lost your first love. And then it also says in Revelation 2 uh, and verse 6 of Ephesus, you are tolerating the deeds of a group of people called the Nicolaitans. Now you say Ephesus, that rings a bell. I've read about Ephesus somewhere in the Bible. And in fact you have, it's the book of Ephesians written to that same church. Most people agree that the book of Ephesians was written in A.D. 60. And yet there's no reference in the book of Ephesians to that church having lost its first love. There's no evidence in the book of Ephesians about that church wrestling with the bad teachings of the Nicolaitans. And so the Ephesus that we have described in Revelation 2 is very different than the book of Ephesians. And so that argues for a leeway period of time. Paul apparently wrote to that book, in eight, uh, that church rather, in A.D. 60 in the book of uh, Ephesians, but then some time passed. Perhaps three decades, three and a half decades passed. And as that time progressed and as that time passed, it's essentially what happened to Ephesus is they fell out of love with Jesus Christ and they became intoxicated with a false teaching called the false teaching of the Nicolaitans. And so because Ephesus is so spiritually different than what we read in the book of Ephesians, it's quite obvious that uh, this book, the book of Revelation that we're studying, could not have been written in the 60s. It could not have been written during the same time that Paul addressed this church in uh, AD 60 in the book of Ephesians. And furthermore, when you look over at Revelation 3 and verse 17, it says something very interesting about the church at Laodicea. It says, because you say, <clears throat> I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. So Laodicea was a very prosperous church as recorded for us in Revelation 3 verse 17. And this cannot be describing Laodicea of the 60s. How do we know that? Because in the 60s there was an earthquake and we know this from extra biblical material. There was an earthquake that destroyed the city of Laodicea. And so when Jesus speaks to the church at Laodicea here, he describes them as a wealthy, financially wealthy, lucrative uh, church. And yet, how could, there, how could they be a financially lucrative church in the 60s when they had just been decimated by an earthquake? It makes far more sense to allow three and a half decades to elapse for, the, for them to rebuild and for them to become financially powerful again. And so that again argues for a date of the book, not in the 60s, but in the 90s. So the book of Revelation was written by John on the island of Patmos <clears throat> to the seven churches of Asia Minor in A.D. 95 <clears throat> towards the end of Domitian's reign. And as we advance the slides once again, another background issue we like to take a look at when we study a, a book is we like to take a look at the structure of the book. <clears throat> In other words, how do we outline a book like this? It's so big, there's 22 chapters in it. How do we outline a book of this nature? And if you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, uh, you'll see very clearly that there's an outline given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, Therefore write the things which you have seen. Now Jesus is speaking to John. Write the things which you have seen the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. And so that little verse there gives us the threefold division of the book. John was told, number one, to write down the things that he had seen. That would be the vision of the glorified Christ that John will see in chapter one. He sees Jesus uh, in, in, in his full glory, and John records that in chapter one. That's part one of the book. And then the outline continues and says, write down the things that are. Now that moves us into chapters 2 and 3 of the book, which are the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. 
And then we have the third part of the book, write down the things that will take place. You'll notice chapter 1, verse 19, after these things. Now, if you go over to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, you have a clue that that third section is beginning because it says after these things. In fact, it says after these things two times uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, once at the beginning of the verse, once at the end of the verse. That's the same gr uh, Greek expression meta tauta, after these things that we find in Revelation 1, verse 19. So that's our clue that part three of the book is beginning. So part three of the book is the longest section of the book, chapters 4 through 22, covering the futuristic vision of the end. And uh, it's very interesting that we can take that big section of the book of Revelation and divide it further. Chapters 4 and 5 is a heavenly scene that John sees as he's transported to heaven to see this vision in heaven and he sees things in heaven which he describes in chapters 4 and 5. Then he sees the worldwide judgment that's coming upon the earth in chapters 6 through 19. And then at the conclusion of that long section, we see what happens after Jesus comes back. He returns in chapter 19 and chapters 20 through 22 is a record of those things that will take place after the return of Jesus Christ. And so it's a record of the millennial kingdom, the thousand year kingdom, which will be established upon the earth, uh, a final judgment before God for the unbeliever called the great white throne judgment. And then after that, the establishment of the eternal state, chapters 21 and 22. And so, uh, in essence, that is the general flow of this book. If you can kind of keep that broad outline in mind, then the book tracking through it is a little bit easier. As we advance the slides once again, things, though, get a little bit confusing. Because when you get into chapters 6 through 19, you'll find uh, <clears throat> three sets of judgments. Seven per set, but three sets per judgment. There are, uh, excuse me, three judgments, seven pieces per set is the point I'm trying to make. There are seven seal judgments. There are also seven trumpet judgments. And then following that, you'll have seven bowl judgments. And one of the great issues here is do these judgments flow concurrently or chronologically? Now, in the slide that was just up a moment ago, you'll notice that the trumpets are taking place at the same time as the seals. And the bowls are taking place at the same time as the trumpets. And so many people see these judgments from God as taking place in a concurrent manner. And I do not believe that's the best way to understand these judgments. I would see these judgments as what I would call chronological. And as we had uh, advance the slides, <clears throat> I give you some reasons why these judgments cannot be taking place simultaneously, but they've got to be taking place in a chronological manner. Uh, for example, uh, in Revelation 6 and verse 4, it talks about a quarter of the world's population being destroyed. And then when you go over to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 15, it talks there about a third of the world's population being destroyed. So how could you have a quarter of the world's population destroyed in chapter 6 and a third of the world's population destroyed in chapter 9? Those are two different fractions. They can't be taking place simultaneously. It makes more, far more sense for, for a quarter of the world's population to be destroyed in chapter 6 and then of that remaining portion of the population, a third of it is then destroyed. So you cannot have concurrent judgments when you have different numbers. It's mathematically impossible. And uh, another reason for this chronological possession, uh, progression rather, is in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 8, it says, um, a third of the earth's seawater is destroyed. And then when you go to Revelation chapter 16, about verse 3, it says all of the earth's uh, sea water is destroyed. Um, how can you have a third and all of the sea 
destroyed at the same time. That really doesn't make a lot of sense. So it makes far more sense for these judgments to flow chronologically rather than concurrently. And they seem to be getting more and more intense as we move through the book. Another reason, if you look at Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2, it talks about a rider on the white horse who we will later identify as the Antichrist (coughs) with the first seal judgment bringing peace to the world. And then as the the second seal judgment begins to unfold, suddenly peace turns into war. So how can you have peace and war simultaneously, that really does not work. It makes far more sense for these judgments to move, not concurrently, but chronologically. First there's peace, and then that's followed by war. Now, as uh, we advance the slides, one of the things that's very interesting is that each of these uh, judgments kind of pull out like a telescope. In other words, the seventh seal judgment will unleash the trumpet judgments, and the seventh trumpet judgments will unleash the bowl judgments. And uh, in fact, if you look at Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13, you see some evidence of this. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13 says, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts. Now, these would be the last uh, three trumpet judgments. And so it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense because the the trumpet judgment that follows it, uh, number five, brings a judgment. And the trumpet judgment that follows that, number six, brings a judgment. But then you get to the last trumpet and there's silence. So how could silence be a judgment? That really doesn't make sense. How could silence be one of the remaining woes? But if you understand that these judgments pull out telescopically, then suddenly you begin to discover that, aha, I now see why that last trumpet is a woe or a judgment. Because although there's silence briefly, it has the effect of releasing the remaining judgments which are yet to come, the bold judgments. And so essentially what we have operating here in the book of Revelation, particularly chapter 6 through 19, are these various judgments, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. They don't run concurrently or simultaneously. They run chronologically. And the seventh in each series will have the effect of releasing the next judgments. So seal number seven will unleash the trumpets. Trumpet number seven will unleash the bowls and so forth. So hopefully you're tracking with us, and these are basically background issues that help us uh, study a book. Sometimes it's very tempting as a Bible reader to rush into a book without fully understanding the background, and that's why I'm spending the first couple of sessions uh, with us together going through these background issues. The book was written by John. It was written from the island of Patmos. It was written in AD 95. The key structural marker of the book is Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. And I've explained how the judgments fit together. And hopefully you're enjoying this book as we take a look at God's program for the end of the age. You have been watching Up with the Sun with professors from the College of Biblical Studies. If you would like more information about the college, please contact us at 713-77-BIBLE or visit us online at cbshouston.edu. Here at the College of Biblical Studies, we offer truth, training, and transformation.